Hi, my name is Aditya Gopalan, and I'm a PhD student at UT Austin. I'll be presenting the paper Stability and Scalability of Blockchain Systems, which was co-written with Abhishek Sankaraman, Anwar Walid, and Shiram Vishwanath. Now, blockchain is a new paradigm for distributed consensus, and we'll start out by discussing how it differs from previous paradigms. Now, in the classical paradigm for distributed consensus, we have n peers or agents who are trying to collectively agree on a value of a function of some existing measurements, and they're going to trade information about these measurements by traditional contact processes. Now, if we think about the example of collecting the pieces of a file on BitTorrent, we can think of the the function that the peers are trying to agree on is an indicator function about whether or not all the peers have all the information. Of course, they can only ever agree on this information on this function if all the peers have all the files. But the thing we should note is that this is a finite time process. But in blockchain, where the goal is to build a distributed ledger, applications such as healthcare or 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 currency applications, actually these imply that we need a constantly arriving stream of information, meaning it's not a finite time problem. Now, this implies that we want the following key aspects of a blockchain system. First of all, all of the peers or the agents should be able to collect all of the information despite the fact that it's arriving. And secondly, all the peers should know that they agree on a subset of information. It's not just some implicit agreement. Now, because we're dealing with an arrival process of information, we might think that maybe we should use this idea of queuing. But if we follow this analogy, we see that customers are pieces of information, and of course the arrival process is the same arrival process. We might think of information as the part in the system when all the peers know it. And finally, service is going to be the information dissemination via the contact process. Now, of course, if a peer creates a new piece of information, it's already been disseminated at least to the peer who created it. So we might think that if we wanted to use a queuing framework, we should use an infinity server queue. But there is one, one big difference between classical queuing and this model. And this is that in classical queuing, service times are determined a priori. For example, if we consider a customer in an MM Infinity queue who requires five seconds of service, they come to the system, they get their five seconds of service, and they leave the system. But in a blockchain, because information is getting spread through this, this contact process, actually the customers are interacting during their service. And so the instantaneous rate of, of service in a blockchain system depends exactly on how much congestion is in the network. And so what we see, at least from a networking perspective, is that information propagation in a blockchain mixes these two models of queuing theory and traditional contact process and distributed consensus. We'll start out now by discussing the basics of, the, the basics of blockchain, and we'll construct a mathematical model based on this. Now, a block consists of three main parts. This block's hash, older block hashes, and a list of transactions. Now, this block's hash is a unique identifier since hash functions are, at least in theory, a, a function from an input set to a uniform random variable. Now, we're going to, because we're treating this blockchain with an arrival process, we'll treat the unique identifiers rather than hashes as natural numbers. So the first block is 1, and the second block is 2, and so on. Now, block hashes are usually created through algorithms such as proof of work, which, which basic, in which a number of peers compete to solve a numerical puzzle, and the person who solves it fastest gets the valid block hash for a particular block. Now, so algorithms as such govern the dynamics of an arrival process, but we'll discuss that in a little bit more generality when we, when we construct the mathematical model. The next part of a block is a list of older block hashes. Now, this lets us general create a nice mathematical model for blockchains by rather than viewing them as a new object we can view them as DAGs and we can see that as follows treat every block as a vertex now each of these references to older block hashes these are going to be directed edges from this particular block to the older blocks that we've put the hash that we've included the hashes for finally a block consists of a list of transactions, which, for example, in healthcare data might be a doctor's interaction with a patient, or in a cryptocurrencies might actually be a list of financial transactions. But in this paper, we're just going to treat this list of transactions as an atomic unit. Now, once a block has been made with these three components, this block's hash, a list of older block hashes, and a list of transactions, the block is going to get flooded through, peer -peer, through a peer-to-peer -peer network. Now, we should note that it's not just a single peer who's creating blocks and flooding them through the network, but all of the peers are attempting to create these blocks and add them to the blockchain. Now, mathematically, this process is described as follows. 
We'll consider n peers who are vertices of, con of a connected and undirected peer-to-peer -peer network each. Now, since the network is connected, any two peers can communicate with each other even if indirectly. And because it's undirected, every communication link is bidirectional. Now, each of the peers P will have a local copy of the blockchain, which, as you should recall, is a DAG. And so we'll call this DAG G sub P of T is going to be the DAG at time T, which is known to the peer P. Of course, at any time T, any information at all in the system is known to at least one peer. So we can consider the overall blockchain at time t, which we denote by g of t, to be the union of all of the local copies of the blockchain. We'll initialize the process by setting g of 0 as a single root vertex with no edges. Now, in a system like Bitcoin, this g of 0 is actually called the genesis block. So we'll consider blocks arriving as follows. We'll take a rate lambda exogenous stationary arrival process such that each new arrival is thinned uniformly to every peer, as, and as we've mentioned before, we're going to index them by the natural numbers. We'll say that each newly arriving block is going to be added to the local blockchain using a reference selection rule, which we'll describe on the next slide. Finally, blocks are going to get disseminated on the peer-to-peer -peer network H using a first-come, first-served, push-based communication protocol, which resembles those studied in the classical peer-to-peer -peer literature. Now, when we discuss the reference selection rules, let's consider a block that arrives at time t to the peer p. Using the tree policy, this block is going to reference the least index block at greatest distance from the root in g p of t. And what this means is that this block is going to try and attach itself as far away as it can from the root, but if there's a tie, we'll break it arbitrarily in favor of the oldest block that we can. Now, this is the policy that's used, for example, in systems like Bitcoin and Ethereum. But more generally, rather than just connect, constructing a tree, we might consider the problem of constructing a DAG and, and think about the same consensus problem. And in this case, we've also, to highlight this, we've considered the throughput optimal policy in which all of the, le all, the new block references all the leaves in GPFT. The paper by Lewenberg and Sampolinsky and Zohar discusses this policy in a little bit more detail. Now, so far, we've only discussed blockchain as a message passing system, but we introduced blockchain as a new consensus algorithm, and we're going to discuss how that works with the following example. Here we'll consider that we have n equals 4 peers, which are blue, yellow, green, and pink, adding blocks by the tree policy. Now, we'll, we've colored in the diagram below. Every block has been colored by the peer who adds it. For example, the blue peer added block 1, the yellow peer added block 2. Now, notice that the blocks 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6 are both more brightly colored and also have a bolder border. Now, this is because these blocks have a very special property. We can see that every single peer trusts the content of, of each of these blocks. And what do we mean by that? Let's consider, for example, block number six. Well, the green peer obviously trusts the content, like the list of transactions inside block number six, because the green peer created that block. But in referencing number six by adding block number eight, the blue peer is pub is is communicating to the network that the blue peer has verified the content of the, green, of the green block number six. Now, similarly, because the yellow peer also indirectly communicates to the network that the yellow peer trusts the content of block number eight, that is also a signal that the yellow peer trusts the content of block number six. And similarly, so the pink peer also trusts this block number six. And so we have this notion that for these five blocks, the special property that every single peer trusts these five blocks. The thing is that in typical blockchain systems, the identities of block creators are not published. And so whereas in the previous, the previous example, we were able to determine that the five blocks had that special property, if we're the blue peer, the only thing we know is that we added block number one, seven, and eight. It could be that there are some blocks that everybody trusts in this figure, but it could also be that every single white block was just added by the green peer. We would never know. And so in order to study this notion of when does every peer trust a particular block, we introduce the notion of confirmed blocks as follows. We'll say that the block i references the block j. If there's a directed path from the block i to block j in the blockchain tag g of t for large enough values of t. And then we'll say that the block b is confirmed if all the peers add a block bp so that bp references b. Note that this definition of confirmed is exactly the notion that every single peer trusts the block b. Now, in what follows, we're going to consider these DAGs in the limit as they grow to infinite DAGs. And so we'll add a very natural performance requirement that as time grows, so too should the number of confirmed blocks. 
Now, we identified a, a, a particular structure of the infinite DAG, G of infinity, which is the limit as T to infinity of the blockchain DAG, G of T, that allows us to know that there are infinitely many confirmed blocks. Now, we'll say that the infinite DAG, G, which has vertex set N, is one-ended if for all blocks J, every newer block I such that, or the fact that there are infinitely newer, many, newer blocks I so that I reference J should imply that there are only finitely many newer blocks I so that I don't reference J. Now, we can think of this intuitively as follows. We'll take the infinite DAG G and we'll zoom out spatially. If what remains looks like a line graph, the result is one-ended, but if it looks like a tree with multiple branches, then there is more than one end in that graph. We proved as a lemma that as long as the communication dynamics are stochastically stable in a blockchain, if the limiting DAG G of infinity is one-ended and locally finite, then there are infinitely many confirmed blocks, and thus, as long as we satisfy the conditions of this lemma, we can guarantee that we have met the performance requirement from the previous slide. Now, continuing the assumption of stochastic stability, we, we show that under both the tree and the throughput optimal policies, the limiting DAG G of infinity is in fact one-ended and locally finite, and so for at least the two most natural constructions of blockchain, as long as we have stability, we can guarantee that we've met this performance requirement asymptotically. Of course, so far we have assumed stochastic stability, and so the natural question is, when, is it, when are the communication dynamics in a blockchain network stochastically stable? Now, to do this, we use the monotone separability framework from Bocelli and Foss, which is a generalization from, from studying the stochastic stability of queuing networks to studying the stochastic stabilities of stochastic networks in general. Now, recall that n is a number of peers, and denote by phi h the conductance of the peer-to-peer -peer network h. Now, the conductance captures information about both the size and the topology of the peer-to-peer -peer network. We find that uh, using the framework of, of monotone separability, we find that there exists mu satisfying phi h divided by log n is less than or equal to mu is less than or equal to phi h, such that the blockchain dynamics are stochastically stable when lambda is less than mu and unstable when lambda is greater than mu. But of course, when we're considering blockchains and stability so that we can meet the performance requirement, we should also consider that blockchains tend to be deployed in applications like IoT or cryptocurrency where in fact, in order to have the widespread adoption that would be required in such a system, we need to make sure that we can continue to meet this, this, this performance requirement as we scale the network size. So we'll say the sequence of networks HKK, where each, each subsequent network in this sequence has more peers than the previous, is scalable if the stability region does not decrease to zero as the network grows bigger. Now, from the stability bounds on the previous slide, we noted that an upper bound of the stability was actually just the conductance of the peer-to-peer -peer network. And so we're able to determine that at first, if for certain topologies, the, the conductance decreases to zero, that topology is not scalable. However, we are not actually able to determine whether any particular topology is scalable. But notably, we find the following topologies are not scalable. And the first are regular grids, for example, Z2, where every single lattice point is just connected to the other lattice points at distance one from the lattice point, or regular trees where there's a root with k children, each of k children has k more children, and so on. And finally, we also find that random geometric graphs are not scalable. Now, random geometric graphs are constru constructed as follows. Now, we'll, we'll consider the unit box 0, 1, 0, 1 on the, on the two-dimensional plane, and each arriving peer is just going to uniformly select a point in that, that plane to arrive at, and they'll connect to all other peers who are less than some fixed constant distance threshold C. Now, if we take this constant distance C to be a maximum ping, meaning that every peer is going to greedily just connect to everybody who's at a small enough ping distance to them, now we've, we've gotten a pretty natural construction for a network, and so it's quite important that sequences of random geometric graphs do not scale. Now, we also did a bunch of numerical simulation to characterize not just that we meet, this, uh, meet the asymptotic performance requirement, but to study how we get there as time grows. Now, in this talk, we'll highlight two of the key metrics that we identify in our paper. There are three more in the paper, but here we'll just focus on the two key metrics. Now, the first is the cycle length. Now, the cycle length tells us how frequently do the peers agree on a new set of information. Notably, the cycle length is actually a convex function, or it appears to be a convex function based on our simulations with some very nice robustness properties. Now, first of all, because it's a convex function, we know that there is a, a block arrival rate, which minimizes the cycle length, but 
Due to these robustness properties, the cycle length behaves quite nicely. And the first thing we can notice is that if we move the block arrival rate slightly from the minimum point on the cycle length plots, the cycle length doesn't change very much. And secondly, we can note that there's actually a reasonably large set of block arrival rates such that if we increase the network size from 10 to 20 or 30, the cycle length also doesn't change very much. In some sense, there's a, there's a good amount of robustness when designing a system for, for cycle length in which the goal is to get as synchronous of a system as possible. But sometimes rather than synchrony, we might care to just add as much information as we can to the blockchain, or to add information as quickly as we can. Here we, we care about the growth, the growth rate of a blockchain. This is sort of how frequently are we adding new blocks that actually are connected as far away from the global route rather than just the local route and the DAG GP. Now this plot also appears to show that the growth rate has a unique maximizer. But one thing we should note is that this plot certainly doesn't have any of the robustness properties of the cycle length plot. Also, an interesting thing that we note is that the block arrival rate that minimizes the cycle length does not appear to be the same as the block arrival rate that maximizes the growth rate. And so we note that when designing newer blockchain systems, it's incredibly important to understand what is the purpose of the system. Are we trying to add as much information as we can, or are we trying to keep the system as synchronous as we can? Because it's clear that from these plots, for example, that the block arrival rate you should choose for such systems aren't the same. Finally, we'll discuss some future work directions. And the first is to improve the bounds for our stability theorem so that first of all, we can better understand stability and also we can better understand scalability of the core blockchain protocol. And the second is to characterize analytically the performance of these metrics, for example, the cycle length or the growth rate so that we can better design future systems for blockchains.